Okay, let's jump right in. We've got a bit of a unique mission today, uh, really tailored specifically for you listening. We're tackling some pretty dense material analysis from practice questions for the VMware Cloud Foundation, the uh, 2V017.25 technical exam. But here's the twist. We're skipping the whole test prep angle. We're going straight for the architectural gold inside those questions. Exactly. We're not about multiple choice here. It's about extracting those core design principles. The stuff these questions show are absolutely essential knowledge for VCF. I mean, the source, that exam, it's 60 questions, 135 minutes. Yeah. It demands deep knowledge across deployment, operations, automation. You know, mm -hmm. so our goal today is to give you those critical insights, maybe some operational shortcuts straight from this technical source material. Right. Let's start at the um, the very foundation of VCF architecture, the workload domain. So you're building a new one. The big idea is operational isolation. When an administrator spins up a brand new workload domain, what are the two specific components that have to be deployed for that domain just to make sure it can run independently? That yeah. you know, the essential pair. Oh, yeah, the core pair. For any new standalone workload domain, you absolutely need its own dedicated vCenter server instance and its own dedicated NSX manager cluster. Okay, I get the function, but let's push on that architecture a bit. Yeah. Doesn't deploying dedicated vCenter and NSX instances for every single domain add, well, significant overhead, resources, management.tesser. Couldn't you maybe just share the management domain's vCenter? What's the big risk we're avoiding by forcing the separation? And that really is the crux of the design choice, isn't it? Yes, there's overhead, no doubt. But VCF clearly prioritizes that operational independence over, let's say, pure cost saving in this case. Mm. Think about it. The dedicated vCenter. It manages the virtualization hosts, VMs, but only within that specific domain. Same for the dedicated NSX cluster, just that domain's networking and security. If you started sharing them, we create a massive single point of failure. One hiccup could ripple across multiple production environments. So this strict isolation, it's really about blast radius containment, administrative boundaries. It makes sure a mistake or a failure in, say, domain A doesn't instantly crash the control plane for domain B. Okay. Okay. So the trade-off is clear. Yeah. A bit less resource efficiency for much, much better resilience and isolation. Makes sense. And that idea, the independence, seems to apply even down to the really small details like dot time. Let's talk about time synchronization. Super critical for stability, but maybe something you don't think about until, you know, your logs are all messed up. Which component is the single authoritative time source for the VCF management domain? Oh, yeah, this is a fundamental one. Often overlooked, but vital for platform integrity. The SDDC manager is designated as the authoritative time source for the management domain. Right, the SDDC manager, and it's the sole source. Why is that dependency so absolute? What actually breaks if the time is off across the different components? We're talking more than just messy logs, right? Oh, much more. You're absolutely right. This isn't just about convenience. It connects directly to security and compliance. Think about all the pieces, vCenter, NSX, the ESX hosts, all the services. They all rely on having an accurate, synchronized clock. If the clocks drift even slightly, you immediately hit security problems. Authentication protocols, things like Kerberos, highly time sensitive. So if your NSX manager is, say, a minute off from vCenter, authentication just fails. Services become unreachable. And like you mentioned, the logs. If the timestamps don't align because the clocks are skewed, forget trying to correlate events during a security incident. You'd fail basic compliance audits right there. The SDDC manager is what enforces that consistent timeline. It's crucial for the whole chain of trust. Wow, okay, that really paints a picture of why it's architected that way. So we've got the domain's core components, we've got its time nailed down via SDDC manager. Once that basic infrastructure is up, the next logical step is how do we keep it running? How do we prevent failures and keep things efficient? So resilience, operational safety. When you set up a vSphere cluster inside that new workload domain, what are the two kind of essential features you need? for both survival and efficiency. Right, you're hitting on the two key aspects, mm. protection and optimization. And for that, you need vSphere High Availability, HA, and vSphere Distributed Resource Scheduler, DRS. Okay, HA and DRS, staples in the vSphere world, sure. But how did they work together specifically within this VCF context to meet that dual need you mentioned, survival and efficiency? Yeah, they're partners. HA is your survival kit, basically. It watches the physical hosts. If a host suddenly dies, maybe a power supply failure, whatever HA jumps in, it automatically detects that failure and restarts the VMs that were running on yeah. that dead host onto a, a, other healthy hosts in the cluster. It's purely reactive, focused on recovery. 
DRS, on the other hand, it's proactive. It's all about optimization. It's constantly looking at CPU and memory load across all the hosts. If one host starts getting hammered, DRS intelligently moves VMs uh, non-disruptively, hopefully, to hosts that have more capacity. Mm -hmm. So they work hand in hand. HA handles the unexpected disasters. DRS handles the day-to-day -day performance tuning and load balancing. Perfect explanation. Okay, let's pivot slightly from immediate survival to operational safety, specifically patching. Imagine you need to apply a patch update to a VI workload domain, and this domain has critical production stuff running on it. You absolutely have to minimize disruption, minimize risk. What's the non-negotiable VCF fleet management best practice here? The first step. Ah, the golden rule of patching production. Control validation is key. You never patch production first. The standard best practice is always apply the patch to a single non-production cluster first. Then you watch it carefully. Seems simple, maybe even obvious, but skipping that step feels like a huge organizational risk. Oh, it is. That non-production cluster acts like your canary in the coal mine, right? Mm -hmm. It gives the admin that critical window to check everything. Is the update itself stable? Did it break compatibility with any custom workloads we have? Are performance benchmarks still being met? You validate all of that before you even think about touching the systems that you know make the company money or run critical services. It's like a built-in administrative safety gate for VCF updates. Got it. A crucial gatekeeper step. Okay, that covers internal stability quite well. Let's shift our view now, maybe outside the cluster, towards the network edge and also the storage layer. Right, so how does the VCF environment talk to the outside world and how does it manage its storage space efficiently? Exactly. So first, connectivity. If we need to handle traffic moving between the VCF virtual world and the external physical network, what everyone calls north-south traffic, which specific NSX component is built for that job, the one handling routing right at the edge of the data center. Yeah, that responsibility lands squarely on the tier zero gateway. You can think of the tier zero gateway as like the main border router for your software defined data center. It sits at the top of the NSX routing hierarchy. Its job is to connect all those virtual network segments inside BCF to the physical network outside, usually using protocols like BGP. It handles all the routing for traffic coming in or going out that whole north south flow. Okay, Tier Zero handles the external chat. Now, shifting to efficiency inside, specifically with VN storage, let's say a VM gets deleted or maybe vMotioned away, we need that storage space back, preferably automatically. How does vSyn reclaim that space efficiently without needing an admin to manually intervene? Ah, yes, space reclamation. This is handled automatically by a feature called Triman Map Support. Triman Map. Okay, for those of us maybe not living and breathing storage protocols, what's actually happening there? Why is that automatic signal so important for keeping vSAN healthy and efficient? Yeah, it's a huge efficiency boost. So traditionally, when an OS deletes a file, it often just like marks the space as available in its own file system table, but doesn't immediately tell the underlying storage, hey, you can physically reuse these blocks now. Hmm. Those blocks become kind of stranded from the storage array's perspective. Trim and unmap, they are basically the commands, the protocol that the VM's operating system uses to send the signal down to vSAN say, no, really, these specific blocks are now totally free. You can overwrite them. Mm -hmm. This lets vSAN reclaim and reuse that space much, much faster. It stops that slow buildup of deleted but unusable space, which ultimately makes the whole cluster run more efficiently. Right. OK, so it's like an automated cleanup signal, making sure the storage doesn't get clogged with blocks that look free to the OS but aren't actually reusable yet by vSAN itself. Precisely that. Stop storage bloating. Makes perfect sense. OK, let's completely switch gears now. Let's move up the stacks to the service delivery layer. Aurea automation, specifically governance and provisioning. This is where organizations really start defining the rules for how their end users interact with the infrastructure. Yeah, we're moving from the foundational infrastructure, like compute and storage, up to the control layer, the policies the who gets to do what, where, and for how long part of the equation. Right, so first hurdle logical isolation. L let's say you need to separate user groups. Maybe the dev team needs its own space, strictly separate from the staging team space. They need to manage their own resources within their own bubble. What's the area automation component that provides that kind of segmentation? That core unit of logical segmentation and resource containment in ORI automation, that's the project. A project is really the fundamental container. It's where you define which users or groups have access, you set their overall resource quotas, and you basically wall off their environment from other projects within the larger organization. Okay, so the project defines the who and the where. Once you have that project set up, 
how does an administrator actually enforce governance? How do you control resource usage and stop, you know, runaway consumption like the dev team spinning up 50 huge VMs and then forgetting about them for six months? Which two specific policy types give you that control? Ah, yeah, preventing resource sprawl and ensuring proper life cycle. For that, you need two key governance policies working together, the lease policy and the constraint policy. Lease and constraint. Let's quickly break those down because they seem to control quite different aspects. They do. The lease policy is all about time. It dictates the maximum lifespan for a deployed resource, like a VM. How long can it exist before it's automatically flagged for reclamation or maybe even deleted? This stops those forgotten VMs from just sitting there wasting resources forever. The constraint policy, now that controls what and where. It limits which specific infrastructure resources may be certain compute clusters, specific network segments, storage tiers that a particular project is allowed to consume. It ensures deployments land in the right place, adhering to maybe performance or security rules. So yeah, one controls duration and the other controls uh, placement and resource type. Together, they enforce the rules. Got it. Those are the essential guardrails then, keeping things tidy. Okay, final piece of this provisioning puzzle. We have the user, they're in a project, the rules policies are set. What are the last two core resources that absolutely must be configured and available for that end user to actually succeed in provisioning a new VM? Right, the final step before clicking deploy. The user needs two essential things mapped to their project. First, they need access to a cloud zone. The cloud zone defines the actual pool of underlying physical or virtual resources, compute, storage network that they can draw from. And second, they need an organization content library. This library holds the blueprints, the VM templates, the OS images, right. basically the approved building blocks they can deploy. So if I'm hearing that right, the cloud zone provides the like the physical capacity, the metal, and the content library provides the approved software or templates to put on it. That's a perfect way to put it, yes. The cloud zone connects the project to usable infrastructure resources. The content library gives them the pre-approved standardized digital clay uh, templates to build their VM from. You absolutely need both configured and accessible for that provisioning request to actually work. Okay, that really ties the infrastructure and the automation layers together nicely. Great. Let's wrap this up with one last point, focusing on proactive maintenance. Thinking about VCF health and diagnostics. An administrator is using this feature, trying to keep a new workload domain healthy over the long term. What are the two main things this health and diagnostics feature actually does to help proactively validate the environment? The key word there is proactive. And it's really about combating configuration drift over time. The VCF health and diagnostics feature does two main things. First, it runs a battery of system health checks on all the critical components, vCenter, NSX, ESXE, hosts, SDDC manager itself, basic, is it up and running okay? Checks. But second, and arguably more importantly for long-term stability, it actively compares the environment's current configuration against known VMware best practices and the validated design for VCF. Mm. It's looking for those subtle deviations. Ah, so that comparison piece is crucial. It's not just saying this service is down. It's more like, hey, someone changed the setting and it doesn't match the recommended configuration anymore, catching problems before they become problems. Exactly. It's designed to spot that silent configuration, drift, those small changes that might creep in over time and could eventually lead to instability or compliance issues. Yeah. That proactive validation, checking against the known good state, is absolutely vital for maintaining stability and compliance in the long run. It helps catch things before they cause a major outage. Well, here's something for you to chew on. Given that reliance, what happens to the stability, the integrity, the security of a really distributed VCS setup, maybe spanning multiple sites, multiple regions, if that single foundational time source, the SDDC manager, suddenly becomes unavailable? Or worse, what if it gets compromised? What sort of mitigation strategies would you need to build around that central dependency? That's a really potent question to ponder, especially if you're designing for high resilience across different locations. Excellent point. Well, thank you for sharing these sources and insights with us. We really hope this deep dive has given you a solid practical understanding of VCF's core architectural pillars beyond just thinking about exam answers.